Let me get straight to you on your outlook for 2021. Now we have a lot more certainty politically about what's going to happen in the United States, including what's going to happen in the Senate and what may become of the sitting president. What we're not quite so sure of is the trajectory of the vaccine distribution. And so I'm curious as to your outlook for the economic recovery here in the US. Thank you, Vonnie, and thank you for having us. Um, Vonnie, like you said, it remains uncertain. Having said that, there is an inclination to think that this is the year of the synchronized recovery. Um, we all had a synchronized downturn almost a year ago, and now people are looking forward to a synchronized recovery. Our feeling is that you will get a recovery, but it will not be synchronized. And it will not be synchronized for four reasons. One is different countries are at different stages controlling the COVID infections. Secondly, vaccine distribution is going to be very different in different countries. Third, the amount of policy resilience is starting to differ significantly. And finally, but importantly, it really depends whether you're a service economy or manufacturing economy. So we are looking for a recovery, but a very differentiated one in which dispersion is going to be more important than synchronization. Now, you say dispersion. Is that geographically across the United States and the world? And how large is this dispersion, Mohammed? Can you put figures on, on GDP growth for the least able and the most able? So first of all, it will be between sectors. Second, like you say, it will be between countries. Um, our calculation suggests that if you just look at what's been going on recently and you were to annualize it, you would be looking at a GDP growth difference between the best performing East Asian economy and the worst performing European economy of 20 percentage points annually. Vani, you know that is a huge number, but that gives you a feeling for how much dispersion is already going on right now. That is a phenomenal number, 20% between the best performing East Asian and the worst performing European. It's also very, very, you know, topsy-turvy, Mohammed. Is this portending some kind of secular change in who we consider emerging market and who we maybe consider frontier market or even developed market? Um, I wouldn't go that far just yet for the simple reason that that distinction has to do with institution, with the maturity of institutions, not just what level of GDP you're at, but also how mature are your institution. And the second reason why I wouldn't go there yet is I think of this in terms of a long distance race. There is no doubt that coming out of COVID, East Asia has sprinted out compared to other countries, and they have been able to control COVID better and bring the economy back on. But this is a marathon, not a sprint. So, you know, I, w I wouldn't extrapolate to the extent of saying it will change the realignment of countries. But I would say that in the short term, we are going to see a significant difference in performance. Fed Chair Jay Powell, even just yesterday, has been looking to calm markets. Of course, we did see, Mohammed that 10-year yield go right above 110, in fact, when it had been, you know, depressed for so long post-March. Is Fed Chair Powell succeeding? Will he continue to as the Biden administration takes over and stimulus starts to kick in, at least here in the U.S.? So he faces a difficult transition in terms of policies. Like you say, um, we, we saw quite a move in yields. The 210s and 230s curve steepened by 20 basis points in five trading days, which is significant in this environment in which the Fed continues to intervene in markets heavily. And that caused a significant change in the narrative of the Fed. And we saw it with Governor Brainard, with Vice Chair Clarida, and then yesterday with Chair Powell. Um, the reason why the yields went up are things that are it's difficult for the Fed to control. One is rising inflation expectations, and two is this notion that if you are a buyer of bonds, you face a very asymmetrical price outlook. So, so my, my own gut feeling is that they're going to have to, to do more, and they're going to be pulled into this very risky policy 
uh, paradigm of, of trying to fine-tune markets. And I don't think that's where they should be, but that's what they're going to be dragged into. Rob, let me come to you and ask you what this all means. Obviously, last year you were focused on Argentina and, and many other emerging markets. We saw a big restructuring. And then this year comes and, you know, the, the playbook gets torn up almost immediately and people like Mohamed Cher at Gramercy and yourself have to sit down at the drawing board again and figure out just where the opportunities will lie this year. You've got to focus on private credit, but where else are you looking for opportunities? Sure. Good afternoon, Bonnie, and, and, and thanks again for, for having us. I, I think, you know, we, we, we start from the, the, the top down that, that Mohammed just talked about, and then we start to um, unpack some of the investment themes kind of bottoms up. Uh, and a few that come to mind would be one, you know, credit differentiation is, 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 is essential out here. This isn't about risk on and risk off. It's about, you know, as Mohammed said, the winners, winners and losers. So, you know, one of the first challenges is kind of using the our distress DNA to be able to differentiate between things that go down for illiquidity purposes and things that go down for uh, credit impairment. Another way of thinking of this is, you know, we, we really need to ensure that we avoid uh, good names in, in bad neighborhoods. You know, another theme that's been kind of banging around our heads is, you know, um, this disconnect between, you know, where financial markets are and perhaps where some of the economies and some of the sectors and industries are. So there's this tension between FOMO, fear of missing out, and, and, and Tina, there is no alternative. And what we always like to think about, which is ROA, resilience, optionality, and agility. Uh, you know, the other thing that we, we need to protect against is, you know, we're, we're in credit. We're, we're, we're buying uh, bonds. And we need to, to remind ourselves that we have to think about absolute yield, not just relative yield. You know, one example earlier um, or late, late last year, you know, we saw Peru go through, you know, despite three presidents in three weeks, they were able to issue a 100-year bond at just over 3%. Um, and so as we think about this year, we're thinking about a, a barbell. You mentioned part of that barbell, uh, private credit. But we want to have high-quality public and private credit on, on one side and then be prepared for opportunistic, dislocated, and distressed on the other side of that barbell when we see things can change so quickly with liquidity. So some of the, some of the concepts we like on the long side, you know, ESG and sustainability bonds. You know, to us, uh, ESG is as obvious today as globalization was 30 years ago. Uh, demand far outweighs of uh, supply. Um, and we like to take kind of this inclusive, have an impact approach to ESG as opposed to exclusive and not being irrelevant. And there's a lot of carrots and sticks that you can build into both public and private credit in order to uh, really have an ESG impact. An another theme out here in credit differentiation is looking for the hidden gems. You know, credits, corporate credits that may be constrained by their, by their sovereign ratings. And that if you compare them to investment grade ratings uh, in developed markets, they would compare uh, favorably. Um, and as you talked about before, I mean, I think one of our favorites is, is private credit out here. We think it's a really important complement to emerging market debt. You know, one of the last cheap lunches out here is, is getting paid for illiquidity. And we have a lot of conversations with our clients uh, on the notion of do you really need um, all of your emerging market debt portfolio to be liquid in three days? Uh, and if you, if you don't, there's a huge opportunity cost for camping in that, in that liquid subset. And you, know, you can probably pick up close to 1,000 basis points. 1,000 And then lastly, you know, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Continue. And I was going to say, lastly, kind of some of the things that, that we're looking to shy away from in this environment of, of winners and losers is, you know, one, Chinese investment-grade entities that, that have links to, to the defense sector, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, the Trump executive orders that are in place that are really going to weigh on the market, um, you know, we think that the U.S.-China relations are moving kind of from trade issues to security concerns. Uh, and we just yep. saw today, for example, you know, o OPEC's lending money to Ecuador to try and uh, keep the Chinese at bay in Latin America. Uh, and we just wonder whether there's enough absolute yield there. We're avoiding airlines. You know, they've recovered tremendously, like 90 percent since March. Um, dip papers are already starting to, to trade below par, and we wonder if oil will be a headwind there. And then lastly, duration. You know, uh, Mohammed talked about the steepening of the curve. We don't even need longer, you know, higher interest rates, but, you know, uh, 50 basis points of steepening or, uh, or widening is pretty painful on these 50 and 100 year bonds. That yeah, have, that's uh, for sure. You issued. know, Rob, Mohammed really outlined what is, is like a K shaped recovery, but for countries, we've been talking a lot about K shaped recovery for US citizens and citizens of other coronavirus afflicted countries. But how do you avoid the, you know, the worst of the K shaped countries' outcome? 
you know, or do you? Are there better opportunities in, in those countries because of things like, you know, the Federal Reserve being the lender of last resort, not just for the US, but in cases like this, sometimes with a feedback loop to the whole world? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, it's about marrying the top down that Mohammed's talked about uh, with the strong uh, bottoms up. And one needs to make, you know, the biggest risk out here is, is credit events. You know, we, we believe the, the central banks will, will continue to support the market, but they can't support bad balance sheets for, for corporate. So one has to really roll up their sleeves um, and do that work. And, you know, we've talked in the past about this notion of, of I love, you know, uh, and we've seen the V, the V-shaped recoveries. We're focused now on the U's, the things that will recover with this secular, uh, mm. you know, synchronized recovery that Mohammed talked about. Yeah. We're even willing to take a look at the L's, things that dropped and will continue to, to provide carry. But what one really has to avoid are the I's, or as you said, the, th the, the bottom part of the K, mm -hmm. that just go down and stay down. Mohammed, I, I want to ask you about Janet Yellen as Treasury Secretary. How will she be different from a Steven Mnuchin or a Hank Paulson if we hark back to the last great financial crisis? She's fundamentally different, and you saw that in terms of the reaction to her appointment. Um, I, I cannot think of any other Treasury Secretary that got immediate support from economists, from many politicians on both sides of the aisle, and from market participants. And that's because she's a well-known person with very strong background. The other way she's is that she brings a very deep understanding of the Federal Reserve to the U.S. Treasury at a time when most people agree that the coordination of fiscal and monetary policy is going to be key. Um, I think there's general agreement that time has come for a handoff, for a handoff from monetary policy that has been carrying too much of the burden to fiscal policy. And it's very important to have someone who understands the importance of this delicate handoff so I think that, that you'll, you'll see that she'll be able to manage this very uncertain time um, well because she comes with a significant foundation of, of knowledge and experience to the, that is particularly relevant to the challenges that we face right now. That's for sure. Mohamed Goldman just upped its 10-year yield forecast to 1.5% by the end of the year from 1.3%. Do you see that becoming a possibility and, and how, if so? So it depends when, when we get there. Um, if we get there by the end of the year, it is not just a possibility. I think it's a probability, and it's something that shouldn't cause too much equity market disorder. If we were to get to 150 in a hurry, meaning in the next few weeks, and, and at one point we were on our way, um, you know, I go back. 10 years and the 30 years moved by, by around 20 basis points in five trading days at the beginning in the first week of the first full week of this year. So we were on our way there until we got a, a change in verbal guidance from the Fed. So it really, yes, I see it get there by the end of the year. Um, but we shouldn't get there too quickly because if we get there too quickly, it could cause some financial instability. Rob, you know, I want to ask you about the new EM investor or, or flows, let's say. It, it feels like this might have been a time for a lot of dry powder to move elsewhere. Has that been the case? You know, actually, since, since March, we've seen a, a really healthy recovery flows into emerging market debt, and we're seeing it again here. In fact, just this week, we've seen uh, record flows. And I think it's the, the character of those flows. It's not just the, the dedicated investor. It's the crossover investor. And I think these investors are also starting to differentiate the asset class itself and not look at it as just all risk on and risk off, but kind of choose different return streams. So within long-only emerging market debt, there's four or five different subsectors, or we talked about private credit earlier. Mm. So I think the uh, capital allocator is becoming much more sophisticated about their approach to emerging market debt. And finally, Mohammed, I need to get your forecast for the dollar. Tough one, tough one even internally within Gramercy where there's a lot of discussion um, as to what's ahead. Mm. Um, I think that's one of the toughest calls for the year. And, and, the degree, and there's no degree of confidence. M my own feeling is that too many people have swung to the notion that the dollar will, will, will get weaker and weaker and weaker. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not so sure that's going to be the case. But, Vani, that's a really tough call.